In this program, the air commanders of Desert Storm talk about how they fought the war, focusing on the U.S. Air Force's role. August 7th, 1990. President Bush, responding to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, orders American forces to deploy to Saudi Arabia. U.S. Central Command Air Forces, or U.S. CENTAF, had to move its forces 7,000 miles quickly. Within days, five U.S. Air Force squadrons and two U.S. carriers arrived in the Gulf. U.S. CENTAF Commander Lieutenant General Chuck Horner recalls the deployment. Initially, we had to get people over here rapidly because of the threat of Iraqi invasion. So we brought over those kinds of airplanes you need to defend and deter, such as air defense aircraft, AWACS, F-16s, and A-10s to ground attack missions, and also the F-15E to provide us capability at night. In just five weeks, the coalition air force outnumbered the Iraqi air force. When it became apparent that we were successful in that initial effort, we then fleshed the force out with more aircraft uh, primarily aircraft such as B-52s, uh, more A-10s, more F-16s. The coalition organized its air power for wartime with General Horner as the single air commander or air boss. We created four air divisions. One air division under uh, General Caruana handled the tankers and bomber aircraft. The second one under uh, General Glosson handled the fighters, the attack aircraft. Uh, Glenn Prophet commanded the Air Division associated with electronic warfare, and uh, General Tonoso had the airlift operations. So we were able to define each Air Division by function, and then that way we could provide uh, the command and control we needed to execute the war. Uh, we began to open locations throughout Saudi Arabia, and as we began to get more operating locations, we moved tankers into locations in Oman, in the United Arab Emirates, and as well as Diego Garcia. The coalition would eventually have close to 3,000 planes. These fighter and attack planes patrolled the desert, providing cover for the largest military airlift in history. Airlift, the hidden part of air power. It was the fastest way to get enough men and material over to defend the desert kingdom. Brigadier General Edwin Tonoso commanded the coalition's airlift forces. And then the deployment of the C-5s, 141s, the Kraft aircraft, the KC-10s, they all just hauled as much as they could, as fast as they could. Very early on, it was evident that Desert Shield was going to surpass by far the number of strategic airlift that we'd ever had before. Military and civilian cargo planes delivered 91,000 troops and 72,000 tons of cargo in the month of August alone to places like Riyadh, Jubail, Dahran. Dahran in the early goings was wall-to-wall -wall planes. Uh, literally, planes would be holding until a plane took off so another plane could land in November and December, after the president decided we needed more forces and we actually went into a second peak. We went through the same thing, hauling maximum use of strategic forces to bring things into the theater. The Allies began planning a military offensive to liberate Kuwait. General Norman Schwarzkopf was commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in theater. His concept for Operation Desert Storm called for an intense, massive air campaign to prepare the way for the Allied ground offensive. Fundamental towards any air campaign is the first job of any war, and that's seize control of the air. Experts from the air staff and major commands throughout the Air Force helped CENTAF build what many consider to be the most successful air campaign in history. General Merrill McPeak became Air Force Chief of Staff during Operation Desert Shield. Our target was the field army deployed in the Kuwaiti theater of operations. Our mission was to expel that army from Kuwait. On the air side, our concept really is summarized here. First of all, we knew we needed to operate in Iraqi airspace, so he was going to have the home port advantage. We had to penetrate into his territory. To do that, we had to take apart and disrupt his ability to stop us from coming in. In other words, we had to disintegrate his integrated air defense setup. 
Brigadier General Buster Glosson was U.S. CENTAF's director of campaign plans before the war and commanded fighter and attack aircraft during the war. Targeting strategy from the start uh, was to take down his ability to command and control his military. Uh, whether it be in the air or on the ground. Of course, we were obviously most concerned about taking it down in the air to start with. The coalition would have to overcome Saddam's Integrated Air Defenses, or IADs. Brigadier General Glenn Prophet commanded the Electronic Warfare Combat Forces during the war. A basic IAD like he's got designed there is, is set up so that the SAMs uh, have an envelope that you, at medium and high altitude that you fly into. It, in order to avoid that, you go in low. If you go in low, you fly into his AAA, and he puts his AAA up uh, with the redundancy that he had in large barrages, so basically you've got to fly through it. And then if you can avoid the AAA and avoid the SAMs, his fighters will engage you at other places in those fezes I talked about in the fire engagement zone. That's the way it's put together. And, you know, it, it could be pretty formidable. And what it's made up of is the systems themselves, the uh, SAM missiles, the radar acquisition radars, the fighter aircraft, and what I call the nervous system, the control system, where you have uh, an air defense operations center, a main one like you had in Baghdad, a sector operations center spread out, and each one of those sector operations center has, has uh, intercept operations centers. That's what that integrated system does, the uh, SOX and the IX. It controls which airplanes are going to be sent against to engage our fighters or our bombers, and which, air, and which airplanes are going to be engaged with SAM missiles. Uh, perhaps as many as uh, 17,000 surface-to-air missiles on the order of nine or 10,000 anti-aircraft artillery pieces, very modern radars, all lashed together with high-tech equipment. So basically, it's a totally integrated system, and our, of course, objective was to tear that system down. One, take away his nervous system, the control of it, the integration, and then secondly, start shooting down or tearing up the pieces of it. Uh, one by one. The Desert Storm air campaign would have four phases. Phase one had three goals. Gain air superiority, destroy Saddam's strategic capability, namely his NBC weapons and long-range missiles nicknamed Scuds, and disrupt his command and control. The Allies estimated the first phase would last 20 to 25 days. Phase two would be short. The Allies planned on taking one day to suppress mobile air defenses in the KTO, or Kuwaiti Theater of Operations. During Phase 3, Allied air power would continue to hit the targets of Phase 1, but they would shift their attack to the Iraqi Field Army in the KTO, totaling close to a half million men, over 4,000 tanks, and 3,000 artillery pieces. Uh, one of the main missions that was given to us by General Schwarzkopf was preparing the battlefield. He called it shaping the battlefield. We had to defeat those elements of his ground forces capable of mass casualties, uh, chemical delivery systems, artillery, armor. An important target would be Saddam's crack troops, the Republican Guard. He was depending on them to drive back the coalition ground forces if they attacked his dug-in army. One of the centers of gravity, we were told, is destroy the Republican Guard, you destroy a lot of the military support for Saddam Hussein. Planners believe that phase three would take about three weeks. The fourth and final phase of the air campaign was to support the Allied ground troops as they moved into Kuwait. Planners estimated the ground offensive would be launched 30 days after the air campaign began. Now, the 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail. Air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. The coalition waited 48 hours after the UN deadline expired, then began their attack. H hour was 0300 on January 17, 1991. That was when the first bomb would fall on Baghdad and when Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm. Over 600 planes were launched that night from bases throughout the Arabian Peninsula, from Turkey, from carriers in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. 
from the Indian Ocean, from even as far as the United States. Now, to give you some idea of the order of magnitude, within the first 24 to 30 hours, we launched over 300 tanker sorties alone to support the strike package that went in through that period of time. There had never been any launch as big a support package as big ever in the history of the Air Force that incorporated that many tankers. In their opening attack, the Allies combined their stealth and precision technology, electronic warfare tactics, and the classical elements of mass and surprise. We had been here since August, and so he had seen every day an AWAC sitting up here and F-15 caps in defensive mode. So he was used to seeing that every day, as well as all the other ELINT collectors, River Joint, and those kind of airplanes. So he knew that was up there, and that's what we wanted him to see right up to the minute that the bomb started falling just beyond the radar uh, warning uh, capabilities of the Iraqi radars, our attack aircraft were forming up in orbits with tankers so that they were able to top off their fuel at the last moment before heading on into the target area. Although they numbered less than 3% of the coalition fighters, the F-117 struck almost a third of the targets on the first day. These stealth fighters led the attack, penetrating the Iraqi IADs unseen. The actual first step that was taken that one could not then stop was a T-LAM coming out of a ship. At H minus one hour and 26 minutes, a Navy cruiser in the Red Sea launched a Tomahawk land attack missile, or T-LAM. Over 50 cruise missiles were launched that night. They would arrive five to 10 minutes after the first F-117 strike. The second thing that occurred, of course, was taking down the EW sites by the Special Ops Forces. At H minus 21 minutes, eight Apache gunships guided by Air Force Pavlo helicopters took out two Iraqi reporting sites on the border. This helped clear the way for non-stealthy fighters heading toward western Iraq. The first actual uh, bomb to fall on Iraq, that occurred at about nine minutes uh, before what we refer to as H hour. An F-117 took out the southern IOC that controlled the reporting sites. Stealth fighters then penetrated the heavy air defenses around Baghdad. We flew 32 F-117s uh, right into downtown Baghdad in the, in the first hour and 20 minutes. Their next target was the principal telephone communication facility, also dubbed the AT&T building. What we refer to as AT&T building is really their central comm node in the whole country. If you remember when the CNN guy was reporting and he went blank at uh, H hour plus about four seconds, that was that bomb hitting the AT&T building. At H hour, F-117s took out the ADOC in Baghdad and the IOX and SOX in the southern part of the country. So right at H hour, immediately by H hour, his ability to see airplanes coming in from the south was degraded. Uh, the IOX and the SOX were taken down. His ability to communicate was taken down, and, his, and the city went black. Having opened up the gateway then, our other strike packages rushed through, and we hit very hard. This was a massive attack in the beginning of the moments of the war. We attacked all of the uh, strategic targets that I've spoken of, the electrical power, communications, air defenses, and so forth. Our goal was to put them into shock and destroy their ability to defend their homeland. We were able to do that by having massive attacks across the full spectrum of targets, primarily command and control and his uh, air forces, and also the uh, surface-to-air missiles. Once we took down what he refers to as SOX or sector operating centers and IOX or interceptor operating centers, then uh, we fired a few harms. When I say a few harms, I'm talking about uh, hundreds uh, in the first uh, 24 hours. Harms are high-speed anti-radar missiles. When fired, these missiles home in on enemy radar emissions and destroy those radar sites. The F-15Es went after all of the permanent scud launchers uh, out in western Iraq and the storage areas associated with that. The uh, F-111s during the same time period, uh, in addition to the T-LAMs, took out some of the power grids and hit many of the industrial sites and the airfields. The uh, GR-1s from the RAF uh, also were very heavy in striking the airfields 
as were the B-52s in striking the southern airfields. The F-14s and the uh, F-15Cs in air-to-air -air mode were there from the start that evening, making sure that the uh, tankers and the AWACS airplanes were protected. The Iraqis never recovered from the Allies' first punch on that first night. Of course, at sunup, uh, the first morning, we uh, brought in the F-16s and F-A-18s. It was uh, almost eerie to how precise the plan unfolded in the first uh, 24 hours. Uh, for all practical purposes, there were absolutely no glitches. Uh, and that's a tribute to the people that work so hard and long in making sure that uh, all the details are worked out. Uh, and the numerous times that we, to use the phrase, that we desk flew the uh, first 24 hours to make sure there weren't any glitches. It was a good plan. It was very thorough, and we, we used a lot of airplanes and assets to do that, and we totally overwhelmed him from the get-go. So he never, he never was able to recover from that first 24 hours in terms of being able to effectively use the defense against our capability. So we seized control of the air in the initial moments of the air campaign, and as a result, made all the rest of it much easier, much more efficient, and possible. The first bomb dropped in 18 hours later, uh, the longest continuous uh, weather front that had hit Iraq in three years moved in, and uh, we fought nothing but weather for eight straight days. Uh, we intended in the first three days to take out all of his nuclear, biological, and chemical storage. The weather really uh, hampered us in this area, and that was our number one concern, you know, that he'd go to those facilities and take the stuff out and start moving it around. The coalition was still able to destroy many nuclear, biological, and chemical storage sites, and cripple Saddam's ability to produce and research these weapons. He was never able to use these weapons against the Allies during the war. The thing that has slowed down our efforts more than anything else has been the weather. The second most important thing has been scuds. We had to divert an inordinate amount of assets to deal with that problem. Although coalition air power destroyed many permanent scud launchers in the opening attack, they did not destroy Saddam's mobile launchers. Saddam was still able to send scuds towards Israel and Saudi Arabia. The scud missiles caused a lot of problems in terms of psychological impact on both Saudi Arabia and Israel. So it became important we locate these very time-sensitive fleeting targets. We actually wound up using 24 airplanes continuously, and then we supplemented those airplanes with strikes. And so it averaged out that we were using almost 100 airplanes a day to just deal with scuds. We used the lantern pods on the F-15E and the F-16s. We used a variety of intelligence sources to provide us the quick data we needed, and then we used a command and control network to put the airplanes over the target at the right time. The coalition knew that the mobile launchers had to come out of hiding and drive to certain areas so their scuds could reach their targets. These launch areas were called scud boxes. During the day, A-10s flew along the roadways looking for them. By night, F-15Es and lantern-equipped F-16s circled overhead. Deep behind Iraqi lines, U.S. and British special forces used laser designators to target Scud missiles for coalition air crews in western Iraq. In eastern Iraq, the new experimental Joint STARS aircraft successfully directed several strikes against Scuds as well. They were able to locate mobile launchers with their radar, which can track movement on the ground. Many mobile launchers were hunted down and destroyed. And at day 11, we were actually at day four and a half in the war, uh, just because of weather alone. And then when you subtract the scuds out, as you can see in the first 11 days, we had only accomplished about uh, three days worth of what we had intended to accomplish. Although the scuds were never fully suppressed, air power greatly reduced their chances of hitting their targets and dramatically reduced scud launches from five a day to three a week. Although the coalition struggled with the weather and the scuds, they had little difficulty with the Iraqi Air Force. They were no match for coalition pilots. We could be running southwest, 901. Three, red. Splash! Splash coming out of westbound. Uh, the Iraqi Air Force was uh, basically uh, decimated at day three. 
uh, it was decimated more uh, emotionally and psychologically than it was uh, in reality uh, because every time they took off they got shot down they could not uh, complete intercepts they couldn't even get close to airplanes uh, and that had to be very demoralizing for them splash two OPEC two splash two OPEC one is engaged second quarter come off high since they couldn't survive in the air the Iraqis began hiding their aircraft in shelters Impact. Boom! There's a hit. There's a shack. Oh. oh yeah. Keep it in there. Secondaries. Big time secondaries. The Allies began to concentrate their attacks on these shelters by day seven of the air campaign. Laser guided bombs penetrated and destroyed over 300 of them. Since they couldn't survive in the air or on the ground, Iraqi aircraft began to run toward Iran in mass by day nine. I think that the one thing that this war has done from an aircraft standpoint, without a doubt, that it has changed uh, mass to precision. Uh, where we dropped 30,000 bombs to uh, take out a target in World War II and 300 bombs in Vietnam, we dropped one in Iraq. Precision-guided munitions are conventional bombs fitted with laser or electro-optical guidance systems. Only 7% of the tonnage dropped on Iraq and Kuwait was precision tonnage. But some estimate that these bombs destroyed 80% of the strategic targets during the war. With the combination of stealth and precision attack capability in the 117, we were able to attack targets very discreetly. We did not carpet bomb uh, downtown Baghdad. We took special care to make sure that we attacked only military targets and we attacked them quite precisely. Air crews were informed to bring home the uh, ordnance if they weren't sure they were locked to the right target. With precision munitions, the coalition could avoid civilian areas and hit leadership targets instead. We went after their Minister of Defense uh, facilities, uh, we went after the security uh, facilities, we went after the Bath Party headquarters facilities. Those were the areas where the most barbaric acts and decisions uh, supporting those were made and executed and controlled from. It was uh, critical to be able to take that element out of that society. And it's also critical to let the populace see that that segment of their society was as vulnerable as anyone else. This was an electronic war like no other in history. The EF-111 was able to go in there very close and jam his acquisition radars, an early warning radar. Anytime we sent a package somewhere, we had jammers, EA-6Bs or EF-111s, putting his eyes out at that particular spot. We had F-4Gs sitting back. Anytime a radar did come up, could put a harm on him, suppress him. And because of that, fear of that, their ability to uh, put harms on them and kill them, they uh, were very reluctant to have their radars up for any length of time. Uh, and what that means is if, you don't, if your radar isn't up, is up for a very short period of time, and you're being jammed, you can't break out a target. You can't work through that jamming. It takes time to work through jamming. And because they were afraid of the harm, they wouldn't leave their radars on enough to work through that jamming, so consequently they were not able to get good uh, PK SAM shots in us. They started ballistic firing missiles, and so that's just like shooting a rifle. Uh, it just goes wherever it's aimed when you fire firing. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the, that's why they've had almost zero effectiveness. Another danger for Allied pilots was anti-aircraft fire. I'm telling you. If you've got as many gun sites as he got and AAA sites as he had up there to defend, you can't take them all out. Uh, it's, it's just a monumental task. So what you have to do is render them ineffective, and the way you do that is with tactics. And the, the basic tactic we use for that was um, we use medium and high altitude to overcome the AAA. The combination of us being able to suppress him and suppress his IADs and him not using his fighters effectively meant that from the very beginning we essentially had air superiority. And that accounts for the, uh, the very good, I would call good loss rates, good for our side. In other words, we didn't lose many airplanes and you look at the volume of this campaign.
as you know, the, uh, the 10-day point, we had lost about 20, 20 22 airplanes. And um, I think that speaks for itself. Phase three, bombing the Iraqi field army, did not come after phase one and two as originally planned. It happened at the same time. We had more than enough air power on the scene to do the phase one job at the beginning, and we simply diverted it to begin on phase three. So there was no time from, the, from day one on that the Iraqi ground forces were not under heavy air attack. The Allies used precision weapons to take down Iraqi bridges, cutting off the army in Kuwait from reinforcements and supplies. On day four or five, I put 11 F-117s and four F-111s, uh, dropping precision bombs and uh, we put seven bridges in the water the first night. Iraqi engineers built pontoon bridges to replace the destroyed ones. Allied planes returned and took them out as well. Other aircraft trolled for convoys. The resupply of the Iraqi army slowed from 20,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons. From the start of the war, B-52s hammered airfields and large strategic targets such as power plants, petroleum supplies, and military centers. But their most important mission hit the Republican Guard. Very early on into the campaign, we were providing three B-52s every hour and a half over a Republican Guard target or a target that had to do with softening up the Kuwaiti theater of operation. The B-52 struck regardless what kind of weather that there was over the target area. Secondly, we struck all day and all night without warning, without their ability to effectively mass a counter air offensive against the B-52s. And as such, it was very, very effective putting firepower on their equipment, their troop locations, their artillery, their tanks, and they could do nothing about it. And it was extremely demoralizing. Behind the bombs that fell and the planes that delivered them were E-3A sentry planes, more commonly known as AWACS. These controllers choreographed the strike packages as they delivered their bombs on the Iraqi IADs, NBC targets, bridges, and now the Iraqi army. The coalition averaged one bombing mission per minute against Iraq. The focus became destroying equipment as opposed to destroying troops. Our initial intelligence of the forces in field was poor and we were sending aircraft out to destroy, uh, say, armor units, and when they'd arrive at the location where they were thought to be, they weren't there, and uh, the flight lead would have a difficult time getting a, a valid target for his flight. So one thing we did is we put uh, F-16s up over the battlefield, we called them killer scouts, and their job was to patrol a 20 by 20 mile box and find the targets in there, and then as we fed the attack sorties into that area, he was able to point out where the tanks were and we could make our attacks much more efficient. We also did that at night with F-111s using laser-guided bombs, for example. Allied bombing was relentless. In the last 11 days of the air campaign before the ground campaign started, with precision weapons of the 111s and F-15Es, we destroyed in excess of 1,000 tanks. We destroyed in excess of 300 artillery pieces. At day 30, General Horner gave this assessment of the air war. We've had some tough times in the 30 days, uh, uh, particularly unusual weather in January. It was far worse than we forecast, and uh, it was only because we were doing so well in our counter-air campaign, taking down airfields and uh, SAM systems, that we were able to uh, maintain the schedule, despite uh, the loss of a lot of sorties, up to 50% uh, some days with regard to weather. Uh, but I think more importantly, we've demonstrated that we've been able to dig out his forces in the field in Kuwait. Uh, we've had uh, particularly good luck with uh, our systems at night, the F-111s, the F-15Es, and the F-117s. In fact, uh, I think their bombing accuracy is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I think the uh, yeoman's work is being done by the uh, B-52s, the F-16s, and the A-10s in uh, bringing large amounts of munitions to bear against him, and I think that's beginning to pay off. It has to be very difficult to be an Iraqi soldier and uh, sit there night after night, day after day, and endure the pounding that he's taken. As is vividly described by one of the POWs, 
said the airplane that they feared most on the front lines were the A-10s because their accuracy, using the POW's words, they never missed. And when they're overhead orbiting and you're in a, a tank or in with a group in a revetment, you didn't know if you were being picked out. So it was a very unnerving situation to experience and had a tremendous psychological impact. Despite Saddam's fortifications all around Kuwait, his flank in Iraq was weak and exposed. General Schwarzkopf wanted to exploit it. He had airlifters position thousands of troops and equipment for a massive Allied thrust through Iraq. One of our biggest jobs that we had over here was to move major elements of the 18th Airborne Corps starting on uh, the day after the bombing started. For the first 14 days, we had a 1.30 scheduled into Rafa every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day. That ability to move that vast amount of people and a lot of their vehicles that quickly, uh, in my mind, Saddam Hussein never caught on until much later on in the ground war that there was anybody even up there. B-52s and the F-117s teamed up to hit Iraqi breach lines as the ground troops made their final preparations. We put massive B-52 strikes in to bomb through those areas so that there would be clear paths that went through the breach areas so that when the troops went through there would be a pathway cleared of mines and the wire would be cut. The F-117s with their precision guided bombs entered the battlefield took out the feed points of the entire oil trench system that he had developed that he was counting on to fill trenches and set them afire to make the breaching more difficult it was time for the ground troops to liberate kuwait general schwarzkopf launched the ground war on february 24 1991 39 days from the start of the air campaign the original Allied plan was only nine days off schedule. Negative radar contact. Roger that. We're garlic one three. Allied air power entered phase four, providing close air support. It's very difficult in a very fast-paced ground campaign such as this war featured for the army to know when and where they're going to need close air support. So we created a system called push cast. And what we did is we pushed sorties forward over the battlefield every minute of the hour, and we were able then to divert those sorties to where the Army needed them for emergency situations during close air support, or if there was no need from the Army, we would then send them on to do an interdiction target uh, beyond the fire support coordination line. There's a CBU hit. I had briefed all of those uh, division commanders and, and cavalry commanders before uh, the war started, and I said, we will destroy a minimum of 50 percent of the armor and artillery before you cross the uh, boundary or before you start the ground war based on what they found i think there's no doubt in their mind or anyone else's that we exceeded 50 percent very significantly one of them relayed to me he said i gotta admit sir the majority of the tanks i shot i shot in a radiator uh, which means the tanks running the iraqis were routed they surrendered by the tens of thousands. One of the captured division commanders, when asked, how come you didn't use your artillery? And he replied, my artillery was destroyed by air 100% before the ground campaign started. And in fact, I called for artillery support from the division next to mine, and their artillery was destroyed 100% by air in transit to support my division. I will tell you my private conviction is that this is the first time in history that a field armory has been defeated by air power. truly was the wind that carried Operation Desert Storm. But if there's one thing that this war really validated, it is the excellence of our training 
and the quality of our people. And I say that not as any kind of an advertisement or any kind of a bombastic statement. It's absolutely true. The uh, people that put this whole thing together are absolutely brilliant, from aircraft mechanics to communications to uh, combat photographers to uh, cooks to uh, pilots flying the missions and intelligence officers doing the briefings. There's so many of those young people that work day and night on those uh, ramps and would sleep two or three hours in a hangar and get back up and start again. And now that's dedication uh, beyond belief, and they deserve uh, all the credit in the world, and my hat's off to them.